from Women for Independence, and I am not a political party member of any description. In fact, it was only three months ago that I joined in. <laughs> I joined in this debate. I have never done anything political in my life. I'm 45, and this is the first thing that I've ever done that I feel so strongly about that I've tried to overcome my issues about speaking in public or going out in the stall outside Marquis or speaking to people about something that I have actually felt strongly about for, for most of my adult life, but only in a kind of like pub conversation type way. Um, and what I found about Women for Independence is that there's, there's a lot of us like me. Um, they tend not to be party members necessarily, or if, or if they are, they've, they've found that they would rather be with the, the women's, have the women's voice rather than being in one of the campaigns that uh, on both sides seem to have quite a lot of men uh, speaking for, for them, like we just said there. Um, so, and in that Aberdeen, we've probably got about a core of about 25 members, and I, don't, I think there's only a, a handful that belong to political parties. The rest of us are just, uh, just women who want independence, and that's what we're all about. And we're speaking to women all over Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, and we're finding that women are fed up of the political rhetoric and the party politics. And that's quite refreshing for me because I don't have anything to, to, to say on behalf of a political party at all. I'm not seeking election and I'm not here to promote the SNP government or the Labour government or anybody. I just think that independence is going to be the best thing for us uh, as a country. I also think it's going to be the best thing for us as women and, uh, and for families. And uh, recently I spoke at an event which was about uh, women and independence. And really, um, I don't really see much difference between men and women in that regard, because I see uh, the issues that affect me are family issues. You know, family issues about the ability to actually uh, have a family and still be a professional if that's what you want to do. That seems to be very important to me. Um, so I'd also need to put my, heart, my cards on the table. I'm not one of these... You know you hear all these people that do this journey to yes, where they've been no and they've had some kind of eureka moment. Where they've turned, I'm not one of them. I have always wanted an independent Scotland. I have always thought that Scotland should and could make its own decisions about what we do as a people and how we conduct ourselves on the world stage. I have always thought that we have the resources to do that. I've always thought that we have the talent to do that. And I've always thought that we've been slightly different in terms of our political agenda to the rest of the UK. And that's been borne out in the last 40, 50 years, where Scotland tends to be more centre-left leaning. Yet, we're getting governments that are ever more to the right. And I think I don't have to mention what happened with the results in the EU uh, the EU elections on Sunday, where there was quite a substantial lurch to UKIP, which frightened the life out of me. Um, and it frightened the life out of me that uh, Scotland put forward uh, an EU member, uh, um, MEP as well. And I, I, that, that worried me greatly. Because I know that we're more centre-left than that. I know, I know we are. And people vote, usually, for, for Labour, and uh, but the thing is that when Labour got into power in 1997, they, their policies had to work so much to the centre right that it became almost unrecognisable from the Labour, like for example, that my, my, my grandfather was a member of. Um, he certainly didn't recognise them anymore. So I've always wanted Scottish independence. Um, I'd love to have a, it'd be so much more interesting for me to have a journey from no to yes. Those people are great, I love those people. I'm not one of them. I've always thought we can do it. But if I had been, in the last six months, the reading that I have done would have been giving me eureka moments all over the place. I have been doing so much reading, and I'm not talking about reading newspapers, and I'm not talking about watching political debates on television. I've been reading source material. I've been going and listening to people who don't belong to parties, like Ivan McKee from Business of Scotland, like Leslie Riddick, people like that who've been looking at the source material. 
that don't have a political agenda. And I'm not going to make any claims that are anything to do with the rhetoric of the white paper. But one thing for me that would have been a massive eureka moment that was in the white paper was the child care issue. My husband and I read that, my husband and I, check me. <laughs> my husband and I read the bit on childcare in the white paper when we got it through the post, the big brick of a thing that is. And we worked out that the childcare provisions in the independent Scotland that are being put forward by the Scottish Government would have saved us at our peak childcare moment. We had two kids in childcare. We never totted it up because we were too feared to. It was a case of like, we'll just pay it. We'll just pay it, we'll be fine. We need a new car, it doesn't matter, we'll get it fixed. Um, we worked out it would save us about £5,000 a year when we buy both our kids in childcare when I had to back to work. £5,000 a year for a family. I think that might have been my Eureka moment. You know, I really think that that been it. We actually wanted to have three children. Um, and uh, we only had two, and, it, and we couldn't afford to have a third child because it was the thought of child, more childcare costs that stopped us. Um, and that's it. I mean, we, we wanted a third child, but we just financially could not justify it. We couldn't justify it in terms of looking after our existing two children. Um, and it would have probably meant me giving up my work as well. And I, I, I like my work, you know. So that, that would have been a... Uh, a eureka moment for me, absolutely certainly. I have fought all my political life against the Tories, but they, just because they think a no vote is the right vote in the referendum, doesn't mean that they're all bad people and sometimes we have to bury our political differences. And the same with the Liberal Democrats, in fact it's the Liberal Democrats I generally have to fight in Aberdeen South, they're my main opponents. But just because they say no, that's no reason for me to say yes. I think it has to be much a much wider debate than that, and it can't just be based on the old tribal lo 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 loyalties. And in fact, that was always one of the great hopes of the devolved Scottish Parliament, was that it would break down those tribal loyalties to parties, because people would have to work in coalition. The actual electoral system was designed to make sure that there wasn't ever going to be a majority one-party government. Now, all credit to the SNP, because they've managed to overcome that um, electoral hurdle and have indeed managed to be an all, um, a, a, a majority government. And I'm going to say something a bit more about the problems that that, that causes um, in terms of scrutiny just a bit later. But what I've been pleased in all of the time is that devolution has worked. This great idea that I had, I remember voting for it in 1979, um, of course, that, that didn't happen then. And that great idea I had of a Scottish Parliament in control of our domestic policies, in control of our health and education, making decisions about an education system that was always distinct in Scotland, making decisions around the law and justice when we had our own legal system in Scotland. These were all the things that we had hoped that the, um, the Scottish Parliament would do, and these, in fact, were the things that it has done. But there's other reasons why devolution has, has worked. It's meant that we've managed to share resources across the whole United Kingdom. So while we may take decisions around um, some of our domestic things, we're part of the United Kingdom. We're part of, a, of the, a country that is very involved around the world in foreign affairs. It allows us in Scotland to punch above our weight because we are also part of the United Kingdom. We're a player, Scotland is a player on the international stage because we are part of the United Kingdom. We are a confident country. We're confident, secure in our identity. In fact, that security in our identity has increased since we got devolution. We um, are seeing the artistic scene in Scotland flourishing. We are doing really well. We've got the best of both worlds. And it's ironic, I think, that this success has persuaded some to believe that we should scrap devolution, because that's what independence would mean, and replace it with separation, being a separate country, losing all of that extra that we get as Scotland, as part of the United Kingdom. And independence is a very different concept 
from devolution. It is not devolution max or devolution or independence light. It's independence. And you need to be clear when people go to vote in September that that's what they're voting for. Not more of the same of all the things you like that comes out of the United Kingdom and a few other things that will put the tart and kilt on which might come out of Scotland. It will be a separation. We will no longer be part of the United Kingdom. And I think that there's a problem on the yes side, that when they see Scotland's success, they say, oh, that's despite being part of the United Kingdom. I say it's because we're part of the United Kingdom. It's because we've got devolution. It's because we can share our resources. We can pool and share our resources across a, a much bigger country, a bigger population. That means that Scotland is doing well. And I think that that's not the reason to vote for independence. It's the reason to vote for devolution. And a no vote is a positive vote for devolution. So what is it that uh, Scotland has got because we're part of the United Kingdom, not despite it? Well, we've got lower employment than we do in the rest of the United Kingdom. We've got a higher GDP per person than we do in the rest of the United Kingdom. We've got a stable currency. We must be the only oppressed country in the world, as the Yes campaign would have it, that actually is doing better than the country that's meant to be oppressing us. And I have to say, I've never felt oppressed in any way being Scottish. Um, and it's, it's a shame that it, some of the debate has, has reached that low level. Because, um, of course, I don't think any of you feel that you're oppressed. I suppose the nearest analogy I've come up in the year, I'm not just know who Torval and Dean is. Presumably, I had to explain that to, to one of my younger assistants. He had no idea who Torval and Dean. You know the ice skaters. So you're looking at the at Torval and Dean, and they're skating around beautifully to to Valero, and they and they're winning their gold medals. And somebody from the yes side looks at that and says, "Isn't that wonderful? Torval and Dean are winning their gold medals. Now, if we could only split them up and make them skate separately, then we could have two gold medals." But of course, if you split Torval and Dean up and let them make them skate independently of one another, you don't get two gold medals. You don't even get one gold medal. You get no gold medals because they're better together. They're part of a pair that actually complements each other. And that's one of the fears I have for Scottish independence, that not only do we lose all the advantages of being part of the United Kingdom, but we actually are diminished as a country ourselves because we can't, we're not big enough to be part of that bigger unit to be able to, to, um, to share with it. Sweden, and I think there was a Canadian Don, there was a Canadian Women's Party at one point, but anyway, I would like, yeah, uh, yeah, Northern Ireland, that's, I'd like to see that, I have been speaking to lots of women who would like that, so, and one of the things that I think that would probably happen in an independent Scotland is that we wouldn't have a two-party system anymore, and one of the reasons for that would be the change in the electoral system would be like it is for the Scottish Parliament. So we would see a wider spread of the different types of parties. We would have more coalition. Uh, I know coalition's a bit of a dirty word at the moment. Um, but uh, in Scotland, it, we would have uh, a range of parties. And because of this political engagement that we've seen over the last year, there are people who, like me, have never been involved in politics before, who are all of a sudden becoming politically engaged. And there is a little bit of a hunger for more representation from lots of different groups that haven't really perhaps had a voice. As the Greens are doing very well in Scotland, although not good enough in the, the, the European elections, unfortunately. But I would like to see one of those parties that spring up, and I think, I, mean, I think it might be the started one today. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to see a women's party. 
And I think that if you've got strong female voices in a range of parties, and maybe a pressure party of a women's party nipping at the heels of the ruling parties, that could be really interesting. Really interesting for women. Actually, on record now, would actually put my hand and say, for once in my life, I would actually sign party membership for a party like that. And I think that that would actually be the way forward for us. Jackie. I'm not very sure I could follow that, to be perfectly honest. Um, legislation, I think, I think it depends on the makeup, to a degree, of the parties. If we became independent, you know, in the next government, I would hopefully like to see some sort of commitment to equalities. I'd like to see it tied into legislation. But I think at the moment it would be, or I would have a wish list. And I think many folk around the tables here would have a wish list. And I think maybe that's one of the things that needs to be discussed if and when we come to that. Which isn't to say that it isn't important. It isn't to say that it ought not to be discussed. And I don't think, if I'm being honest, I'm ducking the issue. But I, I think at the moment, the engagement is about whether or not we, you know, we go for independence. I think that everything that we've got so far in Scotland, we should and must keep in terms of commitment for kind of equalities and opportunities. But like Julian, I think potentially with an independent Scotland, there's a, a wee bit further we could go. And I think particularly if we look at Again, Scandinavian model, Sweden, and some of the, the opportunities we've got there. Sorry, it's a bit fudged. For me, you know, independence is not going to make a difference to that. We've got equal pay now. We should be enforcing it. I work in the oil industry. It is shocking at my managerial level how many people are men. In education, to me, it's still shocking that uh, uh, most of our um, uh, head teachers in schools are men. And so I. I, I think we've got laws there, but we just have to make sure that they're monitored and that they're uh, implemented, um, and we have to still push as women for that, um, to be quite honest. Uh, in terms of representation of, um, of, of women, both in the boardroom, but also in political spheres, um, I'm not sure the legislation is going to, uh, to help that. We need a culture change, we need a change in order to let women's voices be heard. Um, like you, I, I, I just don't think our voices have been heard enough in the, uh, the ref referendum debate uh, up till now. So um, I don't see how um, uh, independence is going to, to move that agenda forward. I think we have a, a job of work to do and we should, we should do that job of work right across um, Britain. Um, I was interested in Gillian's um, uh, uh, Women's Party. Um, uh, well, I tell you, um, you know, I was there. I was there however many years ago it was, 30 years ago, and I thought that that was probably the way that I, I thought at that time. And then um, I was involved in, in single issue campaigns, as a lot of women are, whether it's starting up their own um, you know, childcare group, or, or I was in the poll tax with, with, uh, with Jackie here. Um, and at the end of the day, when, when push came to shove, and it was actually a woman, it was Elaine Thompson who um, um, took me by the hand one day and said, well, you know, Sandra, um, the party for you, although you've been doing all this work and good work it has been, um, if you're going to make an impact in a political party, um, it's, it's, it's labour for you, and it has been uh, ever since. So although I'm a member, I'm not here as a politician, I'm not a politician, but I am a, a paid up member of the Labour Party. Um, and I don't think it will be for individual parties to, or for, for, for legislation to legislate to get more women's representation. But I think as women, we should look at what the parties have done, and Anne touched on this in her speech, because it was very much the 50-50 campaign which drew me into the Labour Party in the, in the build-up to, um, to the Parliament um, in, in Scotland. I was, I was energised by, by that campaign. But the more I got involved in politics, Gillian, I realised that... Um, Although women, um, you know, do make such a huge big difference in their communities and so on, we need to work together with with our brothers and our sisters right across um, not just uh, um, Britain but across the world in order to um, to make to make a difference. And and Anne mentioned um, the woman in Sudan and to think that that woman yesterday gave birth 
um, in shackles in that prison cell just breaks my heart and it should break everybody's heart here yeah. and, and that's why I think um, rather than looking inward and, and becoming independent I want to look outwards and, and, uh, and, and look to those <coughs> women right across the world. Um, it's quite quite interesting that, it, that um, Gillian said that one of the things to do is to, if we change the electoral system, that somehow it would be better. Well, we did that with the Scottish Parliament. We changed the electoral system. We made it, uh, we designed it in such a way that no one party would be the biggest party. We designed it so that it wouldn't be the two-party system. And what has happened 12 years after the establishment of the Scottish Parliament? We have a two-party system and a majority party government. So the structures and the way that a party design and indeed the electoral system on its own does not necessarily or, or ever give you gender equality. If all the candidates you put up are men, it doesn't matter what the electoral system is, the people who will get elected will be men. If all the candidates are white men, that's all you'll get elected. So the political parties have a responsibility. And the, the Speaker's Conference, which I was Vice Chair of in the last Parliament, came to that the conclusion, unless the political parties put their own house in order and have mechanisms that make sure that at least 50% of the candidates in winnable seats are women, then you do not get gender equality. It's as simple